Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. Let's stand together, please, and uh, we're going to sing our first song this morning, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning, then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever, he sought me. in prayer, please. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Next song we're going to sing together, a wonderful song in the Lord. It's entitled Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on high. Higher plane than I have. 
attention to the screen. We are in Psalm chapter 26 this morning, reading the Psalms together as a church family. So let's read this together with me. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with adulterous mortals, nor will I go in with hypocrites. I have hated the assembly of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not gather my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands is a sinister scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place, in the congregations, I will bless the Lord. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Take a moment and let's wave to everybody. And at this time, let's dismiss our junior church. Junior church can go down at this time. Well, it's good to see you here this morning, and for those visiting with us, we want to greet you and welcome you. We're glad that you're here today. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, was a little bit chilly this morning when you got outside? Did that car want to start up? I hope it did. We're glad to see you today. And uh, they, they say that there's a snowstorm on the horizon. Can we even talk about that? Should we say anything about that? <laughs> I don't know if we should, but uh, it's coming, so I guess have your shovel handy. Have it ready. A few announcements we want to make. I want to remind you that on Mondays at 9.15, we have our American Sign Language class, and that's in the building right next door. That's the white building. It's the white building in the big red room, and they meet Mondays at 9.15. If you'd be interested in taking part of that, all you have to do is show up, 9.15, and they'd love to have you. Wednesday at 7, we have our Bible study followed by a prayer time. We're in Colossians chapter 3, continuing on our study in the Christian's Apparel. We have our junior and senior high blast meeting at that time, our junior travelers grades one through six, and then we also have our sunshine bunch ages three through five. Thursday, ladies Bible study. I was asked to make an announcement, ladies, of those of you who participate, that there'll be no study this week. Um, however, there is the sign-up sheet back there next to the sound room, so if you would like to sign up and get your new book, for the Gospel Project uh, Ladies Bible Study, you can sign up on the sheet and they'll make sure that you get that booklet. The study will be resuming on February 11th, which I believe is, what, a week from this Thursday? So they're just taking this week off until we get the new book it's in and then you'll be able to have that. And so um, I think that's all we have for the announcements. And again, we're glad you're here. 
And uh, we appreciate the fact that we can meet together on the Lord's Day and look into his word. So before we do that, let's pray together. And then I'm going to ask you to open up this morning. We are continuing our study in 2 Peter chapter 2. But we're going to ask you this morning first to open your Bible to the Older Testament, the very first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 18 is where we're going to start this morning. But before we do that, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for this opportunity we have to be here today. God, I pray your blessing be upon each one, Lord, as we've come to worship you this morning. We worship you in song. Father, we worship you with our tithes, offerings, and missionary giving. Father, thank you for meeting the needs of this ministry. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people giving a portion back to you uh, that you have given to them. God, we pray for our missionaries, not only in the United States, but around the globe. So many things happening around the world today. I pray that you would protect them. I pray that you would continue to meet all of their needs. Father, we pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ might continue to ring forth, not only through our missionary efforts, but also here from our pulpit, from our churches, here in this country as well. Father, I pray this morning that you'd be with the message that you've given to me today uh, to present. And Father, I pray that it would be received not only with our mind and heard through with our ears, but Lord, it might be receptive to our hearts. Bless us today, Father. Do whatever needs to be done in our lives. And God, as always, we pray that if there's one or more here this morning who have yet to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Father, I pray that this might be the day that they would know for sure that they can have a home in heaven through him, through what the Bible, the Word of God teaches. So bless us today. Fill us with Holy Spirit power. Each of us, watch over us, guide us, direct us, and protect us. And we thank you for it. Thank you for those who would be watching later today from home. God, that you bless them. Let them know we miss them. And Father, we pray, God, that you would strengthen them and encourage them. And that soon we'll be all back together in the house of God here in this place. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to be doing something a little bit different today. What's a little bit different? Well, first of all, you see, I'm not wearing any spectacles, right? And I've worn spectacles since I was in the second grade. And I just had surgery on both my eyes recently. And one is not going quite the way it ought to be. The other one is almost there. But until it is, I can't read without these little grandpa glasses on. So I have to put these things on to read my Bible. And then um, we'll go on from there. So pray for me, and I appreciate it. In Genesis chapter 18... Genesis chapter 18, let's begin reading in verse number 1. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. Uh, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees, this is to Abraham, of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Genesis 18, 1, verse 2. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Look at verse number 16 with me. Then the men rose from there, looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham surely shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, And because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether to the outcry according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, 
so that the righteous should be as the wicked, far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, indeed, now I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there should be 40 found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 shall be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, take your Bible, if you would, and go to the Newer Testament and go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. And this is where we left off last we were together. In 2 Peter chapter 2, notice what Peter writes. Peter is making reference back to the Genesis account of Genesis 18. Actually, it's 18 and 19. And notice what Peter says. Peter says in verse number 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So what does is, what is Peter say here? Abraham, a friend of God, that's how he was known in the Older Testament. He talks with God. God says, I hear of a lot of evil, a lot of wickedness taking place, in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was actually Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. And God said, I will look for myself to see if it is so. And so God has these three individuals go, these that Abraham met, these that left Abraham and went over to the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham speaks before God and says, God, if you find 50 Righteous amongst all the wicked, will you spare the cities? And what does God say? Yes, he will. You see, sometimes I think God gets a bad rap. People say, well, you know, the man upstairs, he, he always puts a thumb on my head. He always wants me to fail. He doesn't want me to get ahead. He never wants me to succeed. That's not God at all. And Abraham goes on, and we just read the account. So you know, 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20. He said, out of all the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, Abraham says, if we can find, if you can find 10 righteous people, will you spare the city from destruction? And God says, yes, I will. And so if you read further in the Old Testament, you find what happens. And Peter, now in the New Testament, as he's writing his letter of 2 Peter, he then hearkens back to that. And he says in verse number, verse number eight here, or 6 here, he says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction. What does that tell you? That in all their wickedness and everything that had spread and all their perversion, everything that was going on, they couldn't find 10 
righteous people. Now you may ask, why would Abraham be making this, seeking to make this arrangement with God? Well, we will see next time when we get together that Abraham had a nephew. His name was Lot. And Lot moved into Sodom with his family and his daughters. Now, Lot had Mr. Lot, Mrs. Lot, three daughters married, so that's six of them, two of them, that's eight, supposed to be righteous people if they could have only found two more. So what does God highlight for us? God is highlighting for us here the wickedness and the, the rampant evil that had taken place. And you say, wow, that, that's terrible. Peter refers to Noah. Remember him, the preacher of righteousness? Do you remember Noah, the account, 120 years of building the ark? Why was he building the ark? Because God said prior to that that man had thought up every wicked and vain imagination that could ever be brought up, ever thought of, ever produced. And God said, I repent of myself that I make man. And today when you see a rain burst come through or a storm and you see that beautiful rainbow in the sky, do you remember what God says about that rainbow? After the flood, God, when he produced that beautiful rainbow, God said, this is my promise to all of mankind that I will never destroy the world by flood again. And every time you see that rainbow, the Old Testament scripture reminds us that we can be reminded of the promise and since that time, God has never, ever destroyed the world by flood again. But let me tell you something. God not only says what he means, but God means what he says. And we've got to remember that. And so Peter is writing to these believers to encourage them in their time of trial and tribulation and in everything, persecution, everything they're going through. But notice what he says at the end of this verse, verse number six. Why does he even make reference to this? Because he said, when God did this, casting the angels who sinned out of heaven, can't be in heaven, no sin in heaven, God's cast them out to be reserved in judgment, chains of darkness. When God did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, preacher of righteousness, and bring in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And then he says, and turning those cities that we mentioned, condemning them, make, what he, why? Making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Do you think God is concerned? Do you think God is interested in how we live today? Do you think God wants us to live in accordance with his word? Do you think we should be following after him and obedient to him and living for him? Two things I share with you before we get going. I've said this to you before. First, when I prepare to speak or I'm working on a message to bring I look for confirmation by way of the Holy Spirit as to what I should present to the church body. I've always done that for as long as I've been a pastor. Before I was a pastor, somebody asked me to speak. I would say, oh, I'll pray what God will lay on my heart. And then, then once God lays something in my heart and I began working this in Scripture, I, I look for confirmation. God, I want to make sure that what you want me to bring is what I'm supposed to be bringing. And the Spirit often confirms this to me in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's through people. Sometimes it's through a series of events or happenings. He brings to my attention on a giving day. And even this week, we're preparing for the message today, have everything ready and, 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 and set to go. And, and all of a sudden, I, I read a couple of articles this week through a periodical, two significant articles, and it was like God said, this is what I want you to do. You are on track. This is what I want you to bring. So I said, Amen. Genesis came together, 2 Peter came together. And then the second thing I want to share with you before I begin, I believe it was Jonathan Wesley, he's known as the father of modern Methodism, who upon instruction of his theology students, um, he would then dismiss them to apply what they learned in regard to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and its application to all of life's affairs, because the gospel affects us in every area of our life. It's not just a church life. 
It's not just we're called by God to come to church and, and take it in here and then leave this place and live any way that we want to. The gospel affects God's work in our life, affects every area of our life. And so he would send these students out to do this. And, and when they would return after the arranged period of time, Wesley would pose two questions to each of his students when they came back. Did what they share result in, number one, seeing anyone saved, come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior? That was the first question. The second question is, did what they share result in making anyone angry while they were encouraging the righteousness of Christ by faith? That was the second question. Did you get anybody saved or see anybody saved, or did you make anybody angry when you presented the message? If they answered no to those questions, Wesley would respond that they failed in their task. So, that being said, I hope not to fail in my task today, okay? Do you get it? All right. We are living in, whether you agree with me or not, and that's fine, but we are living in what I feel are very dangerous days. We are much like the church found in Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, and I want to be very deliberate with everything we share with you today. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you, or that word spew literally means I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because, you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. God says, I counsel you. I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. What is God saying to the Laodiceans? The same thing I believe he says to us today. America as a nation has been living as if God does not exist. America as a nation has been living as though God does not see our sin. Now think about that. The prophet Isaiah warned the nation of Israel against living as America is living today. In Isaiah chapter 22, again, I want to be very deliberate with this. In Isaiah 22, verses 8 through 13, he removed the protection of Judah. You looked in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. You have also saw the damage to the city of David, that it was great. And you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. You numbered the houses of Jerusalem and the houses you broke down to fortify the wall. You also made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But you did not look to its maker nor did you have respect for him who fashioned it long ago. And in that day, the Lord God of hosts called for weeping and for mourning, for baldness, for girding with sackcloth, but instead you joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating meat, drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. As we consider the events that surround us today, we must always remember, always remember, 
that Almighty God is in control. Amen? Amen. There is nothing that takes God by surprise. Nothing. We need also remember that God is no respecter of persons. What do I mean by that? I have no idea your political persuasion, but do you, you know what? Wake up one morning and realize that God is not a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a Libertarian or any of that. That's not God. That's not God. God is not a favorite sports fan. That's not God. God doesn't select one over the other. That's not God. What God does see and he selects is righteousness by the truth of his word over evil and wickedness against those who go against him and his word. We see that throughout the scripture. But keep in mind, as Peter wrote in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So you see, conversely, the other side of that. So I want you to listen this morning. Four things quickly I want to consider with you this morning. And, and if we put a title to the message, it would simply be this. Where was Sodom's Bible? And where is yours? Where was Sodom's Bible? And where is yours? First, let's start where we need to start, and that's with the truth. Let's start with the truth. A nation will be blessed whose God is the Lord. That's not something I'm making up in my mind. That's not something that's manufactured by our church, any other church like this church, or any other believer. In Psalm 33, verse 12, the psalmist wrote, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Now, I want to point this out to you. Notice what God says. He talks about the people he has chosen, chosen and he has blessed that nation of people whose God is the Lord. God doesn't choose because of a building. God doesn't choose because of the business. God doesn't choose because of a program. God doesn't choose because it's a popularity contest. God chooses a nation who would be blessed of the Lord because it's a people he has chosen for his own inheritance. It's a people who will follow after him. Truth number two, we are to glory in God and not ourselves. Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 2 says, And you shall swear... The Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nation shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. You know what? God does anything in this world. We can't pat ourselves on the back and say, look what we did. God does anything in turning our nation around to him. We can't pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, look how we put that together. We didn't do any of it. We look to God. We glory in God, not ourselves. A third truth is that righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. So turn that around. If righteousness exalts a nation, what pulls a nation down? It's when we get ourselves into wickedness and evil and unrighteousness. According to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You don't hear a lot of preaching about sin anymore. Why? Nobody wants to be told that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. Nobody wants to be told that they're wrong. Nobody wants their lifestyle put in check when they think they can do whatever, whenever they want. And God says, beloved, no, you can't. Another truth, there is a price for forgetting God. Folks, 
not just this nation, the world. We are on the cusp of this price. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 17, the Bible says, The wicked shall be turned into hell in all the nations that forget God. All of them. God doesn't say you have favored nation status. Even the children of Israel, they were his chosen people. Did you see in the Old Testament what happened to the children of Israel when they decided they knew best, when they decided they didn't want to follow after the righteousness of God, they wanted to live their own life, their own way? And they ended up giving themselves over to abominations and idolatries? Did God just wink at that? Did God just turn and look the other way? No. No more than when I was a child and I was growing up. And, and I'll tell you what, my, my folks, I mean, my folks believe, spare the rod, spoil the child. Amen? And when I did something wrong, I'll tell you what, God provided a place. It's called the bottom. It's called the seat. You know, it's kind of puffy, squishy. It's got a little extra skin there. Right? A little extra muscle there. I mean, my folks would take that rod, and boy, I'll tell you what, when I did something wrong, shebang! Was it because they hated me? No, it's because they loved me. I used to just say, I wish you didn't love me so much. <laughs> they loved me. And it helped me. Did God do that with Israel because he hated them? No, because he loves them. Does God say here the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations and forget God because he hates the world? He hates everybody in the world? No. He's seeking to give a truth that will draw people back. And that brings us to my second point, the turn. The turn. America has turned from God. I don't think there's any wonder about that. America has had many opportunities and blessings that many have never enjoyed. But we've made that turn. We started out as one nation under God. We started out trusting God. We started out believing in God. We started out depending on God. And now everybody, even Christian apologists alike, say we are now what might be referred to as a post-Christian nation because of our turn. In our text, we find a reference made to Sodom. 2 Peter chapter 2, again, verse 6, and the cities, and turning, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Think about Sodom with me for a moment. I, I'm praying, thinking about this. Think about Sodom. Where were the churches in Sodom? Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain. Where were the churches? Synagogues. Meeting places. We have thousands in our country. Thousands of good Bible preaching churches. Now, many of them are shutting down every week. I read reports. Every week there's 25, 30, 40 churches a week, a week that are closing their doors. Where were the Bibles in Sodom? Where were the scrolls? Where were those... Scrolls that they'd have that, that they would, they would be brought into the synagogue to be read, to be sung, to be prayed over. We have millions of Bibles in this country. Probably tens of millions of Bibles. I, I know myself, I have a whole bookcase, shelves of Bibles. Different versions, different translations. Study Bibles. Bible study helps. Just scripture alone. But I have them. We have in our country millions. Where were the preachers of the day in Sodom? Where were the pastors? We have thousands in this country. You don't believe that's true? Get on the internet. Do a little scrolling. Find it. Every state. Everybody's got a blog or everybody's putting forth an article or this preacher's writing an article or this preacher's writing an article. We have thousands. Where were the Christian schools in Sodom? We have hundreds, thousands there. Where were the prayer meetings? We have tens of thousands of prayer meetings. I belong to a prayer group. I can get on there, put a prayer request, and that can hit every state in the country. Been doing that for years. Thousands of people hitting their knees in prayer. 
through these prayer meetings. Where were the prayer meetings in Sodom? Listen, Sodom had little history of God's judgment to warn them of their dangerous sin. We have volumes of history warning us. Volumes of history warning us. Folks, what obligation has a holy God to a people who spend one hour in church on Sunday then walk in the counsel of the ungodly the rest of the week? What obligation does God have to us if that's our only spiritual time? There's got to be more than that. Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. I don't know if you notice our sign out front. I hope you did. Life is precious from the womb to the tomb and is such an onslaught on the preciousness of life today. Now, this is not what the message is all about, but I started thinking about this. What obligation has God to a people who since 1973 have taken the lives of more than 61 million babies in clinics and hospitals? 61 million million. The population of this country is a little over 300 million. Between 300, I, I read three, 315, 330 million people. 61. That is one-fifth of the present population. You know what I often think about? What little one was lost? Maybe they were the next scientist. Maybe they were the next doctor to invent the cure for cancer. Maybe they were the next person that was going to take us beyond the reach of the moon and the planets. Maybe they were that teacher that excelled all other teachers. Maybe they were that mom that, that raised, like Susanna Wesley, another group of preachers and songwriters and hymn writers for God. But we'll never know. They came from God and they went back to him but we'll never know. Oh, so many things have been said about this. And it's grieving. It's grieving. I can't tell you the number of people I talk to. And, 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 if, and if this is part of your story, God knows my heart. I am so, so sorry. I really am. You, you, you made a heartbreaking decision. I know you did. But I also want to remind you that God is a God of life. Amen? Amen. And we sight on life. We sight on life. And God, listen, God, not only, not only does God love you, but God has forgiven you. It's done. You are forgiven in Jesus Christ. So we can encourage others today. I met with somebody not long ago, and, and, and they had, when they were young, they did, and, and it just, it, it, it has tortured them. And we sat with them and said, you're a believer. God loves you, and God forgives you. And, and, and it, you could just see that wash over them like, like I'm forgiven. And, and you'll see that little one again, I'm forgiven. And the number of people that I meet with, it's, I say to them, what about adoption? Do you know how many families there are out there that cannot have a child and they want one to bring into their home to love and to cherish? What about adoption? What obligation has God to a people whose religious coalition for reproductive rights stated in an ad that this is a personal decision Beth left in the hands of a woman and her God, pro-faith, pro-family, pro-choice? What a contradiction in terms. God has always been about life. Amen? From the beginning. God created a man and a woman. He said, go create life. What obligation is God to a people who place on its currency in God we trust and then ban children from singing Christmas carols, passing out Christmas cards, exchanging Christmas gifts in a school, allowing a minority of people to cause a law to be passed, not allowing for prayer or God's word in its schools or symbols of faith to be placed on their property? What obligation has God to us? What obligation has God to a people who have made all manner of perversion legal, knowingly going against the commands of God? 
What obligation has God to a people whose governmental leaders place their endorsement on such perversions when the majority of its nation find it abhorring? What obligation is God to us? Now, there may be somebody here this morning say, well, tread lightly, Pastor. Be careful what you're saying. You can't talk about such things. Really. Didn't God provide salvation through his son, Jesus Christ? Yes. We talk about him. We tell people about the forgiveness of God. We tell people about how God is loving and merciful. We talk, talk about to people, even when we've sinned, God is there to forgive and to lift us up and to carry us on. Didn't God create the family? And we talk about the family. We talk about the relationships that we have. Husbands, wives, moms, dads, grandparents, children, that family unit. Didn't God institute government? Then we talk about government. Government is not a creation from us. Government was instituted by God. It was only the government telling us you can't talk about government. When God created it, instituted it. Didn't God bless us with his church? And we talk about the church. We thank God for his church. Listen, when these things are right, we talk about how they're right. When any of these things go wrong, we talk about how they're wrong and how they can be made right. What obligation has God to a people who consume millions of gallons of what God calls a mocker, raging drink, or sanction what are illicit drugs that are now permissible for everyday and recreational use? What obligation has God to a people who worship and serve the creature rather than the creator? Romans 1.25. What obligation? If you're familiar with your Bible, then you remember Joshua's reminder to Israel in Joshua 22, verse 29. This is what Joshua said. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord. And yet, isn't that exactly what we're doing in America today? Folks, isn't it? Isn't it what we're doing? Hasn't America turned her back on God? Doesn't America thumb its nose, her nose, at God? America has said, I did the Laodiceans, we are rich and we have need of nothing. The book of Judges speaks that everyone did that which was right, get this, in their own eyes. If you have the truth, and then you see the turning and what obligation would have to a nation who's turning from him. Then you see the result in this and it's turmoil. Turmoil. We are facing things we've never faced before. Think about it. Viruses with no cures, children slaying children in schools, terrorists running loose, destroying people and property, government leaders, and yes, many of our churches forgetting about the founded on God beginning of our nation. Not only are they forgetting, they're rewriting it. They're leaving history out. Isaiah 5, verses 20 through 23 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent or sensible in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. What does God say? Woe to them. Folks, I'm going to tell you what. It's not a popular message. It's not a po Nobody wants to be told... Um, you're off here. Nobody wants to be told you're, you're turning away from God. Nobody wants to be told 
That's sin, and God cannot bless sin. You can never sin and win. Nobody wants to be told that. And that brings us now to the treatment. Praise God for treatment. A very familiar verse to you in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says what? Then. Well, wait a minute. My people called by my name. So these are the people of God. He said, if the people of God will pray, seek his face, turn from their wicked way, they've humbled themselves in this. God says, then I will hear from heaven and will what? Forgive their sin and heal their land. But where does that start? It starts where it needs to start, and that is when we humble ourselves. Awfully hard to get the attention of a proud and arrogant type of individual, isn't it? We have to humble ourselves. It's to have the spirit of humility. It's two people are arguing, and they get louder and louder to the point where the one can't even hear what the other one says anymore. It's not until one of them stops and says, we can't do this. We have to stop. We have to listen. Because this is not going anywhere. We have to humble ourselves. God then, after humbling ourselves, he says we need to repent, we need to seek forgiveness and his face. What does Jeremiah 36.3 say? Jeremiah 36.3, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the advers adversities which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And then finally he says, turn to me. Humble yourself, repent, seek forgiveness, seek my face, and turn to God. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 9 and 10. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which were written in this book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Do you see it? Do you see it? We were walking with God. We were turned with God. We were going God's direction. God was blessing us. God was taking care of us. And somewhere along the line, we have begun to turn not toward God anymore, not walking with God, but turning away from God and walking after our own mind and our own direction. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 6 through 9, then the runners went through all of Israel and Judah with their letters from the king and his leaders and spoke according to the commandment of the king. Children of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. And do not be like your fathers and your brethren who trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers so that he gave them up to desolation as you see. Now do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God that, with, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brethren and your children will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive so that they may come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not... Turn his face from you if you return to him. The psalmist said in Psalm chapter 80, verse 3, Restore us, O God. Restore us. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. In Psalm chapter 80, verse 7, Restore us, O God of hosts, and cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. Ezekiel 14, 6, Therefore says to the Lord of Israel, the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Repent, turn away from your idols. And turn your faces from all abominations. God said in Ezekiel 18, 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, what does God say? Turn and live. 
And then finally, Hosea 12, 6 says, So you, by the help of your God, return. By the help of your God, return. Observe mercy and justice and wait on your God continually. Beloved, listen. America is living and surviving today only by the grace and mercy and long-suffering of our God. Harken back in history, 232 years ago, to the prophetic warning of our first president, also known as the father of our country, George Washington, who said in an address to our young nation at that time, he said this, quote, the propitious or favorable smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right that heaven itself has ordained, end of quote. Author of the book entitled The Harbinger, Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Karn, he states in regard to Washington's address, he says, in other words, Washington reminds us, if America follows the way of God, his eternal rules of order and right, the blessings of God would remain upon it. But if America should ever depart from the ways of God, then his blessings would be removed from the land. Listen, we as a nation have received all the warning signs that Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain lacked. And I think we could all agree that providence has smiled on us these many years. We have triumphed through many a crisis, but... As one writer stated, all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot avert the current and coming judgment awaiting them. What can turn it around? I believe only repentance by the broken and contrite hearts of Christ's followers, by you and me in our churches, can turn back the judgment of God upon our land. I look at Psalm chapter 85 and I'm encouraged and I'm reminded. And I say to myself all the time, and I say for this church, our body of believers here, God help us to pray with the psalmist, restore us, O God, of our salvation and cause your anger to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not, let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. So what is Bible? Where's yours? Are we reading it? Are we believing it? Are we taking it in? A candle burns the brightest when the room it is in is the darkest. I've given a lot of thought and prayer to this over the last couple of months. And I firmly believe that this could be the time for the greatest, the greatest awakening of revival ever to pour out on America by God's Holy Spirit if we will but turn our hearts back to God and not depend on our own strength and might. Be the candle burning the brightest when the room is the darkest. It's dark. I fear it's going to get darker. But as we said in the onset, God is in control. I'll leave you with this last thought. William A. Ogden, don't know if you're familiar with him, but in 1887, 134 years ago, he wrote the hymn entitled Look and Live, and I love the chorus of this old hymn. He says, look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. How relevant 134 years later that song is to us today. Folks, Jesus is 
the answer still. And I hope you believe that with all your heart. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity we have to be here today. Father, thank you for allowing me to present this message that you've given to me, verses of scripture, the confirmation you've given me laid on my heart. And Lord, while I know it's, it's a, it could be a difficult message, it's one, Lord, that's needed. It's one that we need to remind ourselves of the greatness of God who worked in our nation and who continues to do so. But we think of the evil and the powers that would like to not only destroy it, but destroy any semblance of righteousness and truth of the gospel to hinder us from telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ, giving them an opportunity to know for sure their sin can be forgiven in heaven their home. God, I pray you'd use us today, each one of us, who name the name of Christ. Father, help us to be true and faithful. And while there's always some things that we may not always agree with, one with another, we can all agree on this, if we're a child of God, that you are the Lord our God, and beside you there is none else. And you've given us a word to read to hide in our heart and to live by today. It's the word that our fathers before us had and then before them. And I pray that you help us to be faithful and true. Maybe you're here this morning and you've yet to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Oh, you know of Jesus with your mind. But you've never got to the place to say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. I turn from my sin, I turn to you. I ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me. His death on the cross for my sin, his resurrection, conquering both death and the grave, I turn to him. Say, preacher, would you pray for me? I need Jesus. I need to ask him into my life. Is that you today? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just slip up your hand and say, Preacher, would you pray for me? Anybody like that this morning? Just slip it up and put it down. Slip it up and put it down. All right. Christian, a difficult message to bring today, probably a difficult message to hear. But I believe it's what God would have us to bring today, and I believe it's what God wanted all of us to hear. And I pray for you, and I ask you to pray for me that we might be strong in these days in which we live, that we might stand for the cause of Christ and righteousness and truth, that we might stand for life, we might ask God to work in us and through us until he comes again. Say, preacher, I'm praying with you. You pray with me. Anybody like that this morning? Slip your hand up. I'm praying with you. We pray for our nation. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We need it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity we have to be here today. Bless us, Father. Give us safety as we travel to our homes. We thank you for each man, woman, young person that's gathered in our room today. Watch over them, protect them, keep them safe. And we thank you in Jesus' name. For his sake, we pray these things with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you and have a great week in the Lord.